All right. So, um, yeah, this morning I wanted to kick us off with just a little bit of a welcome, um, tell you a little bit about what some of the work that we're doing at UCI that relates to, to what you all research. Um, and yeah, so, but before I, A minute. Before I begin, I wanted to first um, offer a land acknowledgement. Um, we are currently located on land that the ancestral and unceded territory of the Hashemin and Tongva peoples. Um, and I'm going to read a land acknowledgement that we developed for the university. It's not yet officially adopted, but um, I've been part of the task force to make this. And so I think it conveys what we want to to say when we talk about the original inhabitants of this land who are still, still very much a part of this place and community. So as a land grant university, the University of California, Irvine occupies land located in the ancestral and unceded territory of the sovereign Ahashaman and Tongva indigenous peoples, whose traditions of caretaking and protecting this land continue today and who are an integral part of our student, faculty and staff community. We acknowledge these original stewards of the land where we live, work, and study, who despite the violences of colonialism, including land theft, forced displacement, and racism, still hold strong cultural, spiritual, and physical ties to this region. To move beyond the land acknowledgement, UCI commits to confronting and dismantling systems of oppression through education and our everyday actions. We commit to respecting the Hashman and Tongva people's ties to the lands managed by UCI including the UC Natural Reserves. All UCI community members are responsible for establishing and sustaining good relationships with local indigenous peoples and ensuring that they are welcomed as active participants in university activities. We must make consistent efforts to unveil the complex historical context within the indig indigenous communities we serve so that our actions do not perpetuate the erasure of the very people we seek to honor and uplift. Um, and I'm showing you up here a map um, from the Digital Atlas of California Native Americans, which is the most detailed um, map that was compiled by a number had contributions from all the tribes in California, um, showing the ancestral territory. So we're located right about here, just kind of near, near between Newport Beach and Costa Mesa-ish. And as I said, this is a shared territory of the Tongva and Ahashman peoples. Okay, and now I wanna just say a quick thank you to everyone who helped make this happen. Um, I think um, Nenian, you all know, um, those of you who are BAF fellows anyway. <laughs> And I'm glad to say, I, I met um, many of you last night, but I'm Kathleen Johnson. I am the um, professor of Earth System Science here and um, helped also co-organize this. And then we also are really grateful to Aranda Tripathi from the UCLA Center for Diverse Leadership in Science, um, as well as Jessica Hackman and Kira Fish, who are also part of the CDLS at UCLA. Um, and who will be helping with managing the Zoom today. Um, they unfortunately are here in person. Um, and then um, Carlo Chunga Pizarro. Um, <laughs> played a very vital role. Um, and so you can ask him first if you have any questions. <laughs> um, and then Robert Garcia, who's way in the back there who you met last night as well. So Robert is um, is an academic coordinator here uh, extensively with this. So it was a true collaborative effort. Um, and so, yeah, it was really fun actually working with everybody on that group to put this together. I also wanna thank um, the sponsors who provided funding for this, um, for this workshop and to help all of you be here today. Um, we, we were able to, to get contributions from many different schools and centers across campus, including um, the UCI, UCI Schools of Education, the School of Physical Sciences, the School of Social Ecology, um, the School of Engineering, 
and um, the Office of Inclusive Excellence, the Center for Diverse Leadership and Science at UCLA, um, Professor Jim Renderson, um, who is the Chancellor's Professor of Earth System Science at UCI, the Cicero Professor, um, donated some funding to support this, um, and will probably be around today. So if you see that person, you can say thank you. <laughs> um, and then um, I also want to give a shout out to the Research Justice Shop, who we're working really closely with on the UCI Climate Justice Initiative, which is the program that I direct that is one of the main um, main main contributors in terms of the organization. So Robert and I both um, work on the UCI Climate Justice Initiative. Some of our speakers today are part of it. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, many CJI people are gonna be here. Some are here right now and many will be in and out throughout the day. And some might be joining us for dinner. Um, and then I have NSF up here because that's NSF is what funds the Climate Justice Initiative. I wanted to share a little bit more about what CJA is. Um, but the Climate Justice Initiative is funded by NSF for a program called Cultural Transformation of the Geoscience Community. And it's really about changing how we do science to make it more inclusive, make it more attractive, increase recruitment and retention of people from marginalized backgrounds. And the way that we are approaching this is through um, training scientists, climate scientists, climate researchers from many different fields um, in cross-disciplinary approaches to addressing climate change and to um, to working with, to how to go about working with communities. And you're going to hear from um, Connie McGuire, who is helping lead some of that effort later today. But the guiding principles then of, of the CJI is recognizing the fact that many people have different pathways into and out of out of um, STEM and out of geoscience or out of climate science. And um, we want to recognize and acknowledge that there are many different pathways and there's no one right way to navigate this process. And so <laughs> our guiding principles are, we want to address climate impacts, adaptation and solutions through an equity lens, um, ethically engage with communities, moving away from the extractive model that has been long been a norm in geosciences and many other fields of academia. Um, respect, we want to respect multiple ways of knowing, respecting indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, um, centering social and environmental justice in climate research, and working to actively dismantle systemic racism. Um, and then finally using a transdisciplinary approach that brings in expertise from several fields, including social sciences, humanities, um, and, and many more. So what are we actually doing with the Climate Justice Initiative? It's actually a post-baccalaureate and a PhD training program. Um, we provide funded fellowships to PhD students and to um, people who recently graduated with their bachelor's degree. And so this is our first cohort this year. Um, we have six post um, and 11 PhD fellows. Are any of these folks in the room? Could you maybe, uh, I know I've seen a few around. So can, are there any post here? I don't see yet. Too early for them, maybe. <laughs> I've seen a couple of PhD fellows at least. Can you uh, raise your hand? <laughs> All right, so yeah, we have a couple of PhD fellows and then um, I think more will be showing up throughout the day. And we also have two postdoc researchers who are part of the CJI and that's uh, James Adams back there and T. Trunk, who's up here. Um, and so feel free to say hi and chat to people and ask them about what they're doing. Um, as you're here, um, yep. Do the, do the postbacks actually are they able to transition to be um, PhD fellows? Yeah, so the question was do the postback fellows transition to the PhD fellows for the people on the Zoom? Um, and that's not something this is our first year. We do know that several of our postbacks, the purpose of the postback program is to help these students who maybe can benefit from a little bit more experience, both technical training, research experience, as well as we give a lot of professional development and mentorship activities. 
And the pathway is not necessarily specifically a bridge to PhD programs, it's to help them get into careers or go to grad school, whatever they'd like to do. Um, but I will say that some of our prospects are applying to grad school right now, and some of them, I think, even are applying to UCI. So that would be great. <laughs> um, the uh, next call for applications for this is coming in early 2024. For those who are listening from UCI or know graduate students at UCI, the PhD fellowships are only for UCI students who are needing to be admitted or enrolled in a program here. The post-bac fellowships are, are for, many, for anybody. Um, across the, the country. So out of our six close back, we only have one that did their undergraduate here at UCI. And um, part of what they're doing is going through a curriculum where um, they learn about environmental justice and community-engaged research methods. And then we also work with four community partners in, in Orange County, and they will be going through the process of co-design and conducting a research project that's of interest to these partner organizations. Um, and then part of the broader goal is really building a community at this university where we have, as a huge university, there's like 37,000 students and we, um, we have so many different departments and schools across campus that study climate change and, and environmental justice. And so we're hoping to provide some events that will bring people together from across campus, including this one. So this is one of our first big events that we've, we've put on. And then just a quick photo. I don't know if you'll recognize any of these folks if you see them later, but they will have name tags on too. So um, feel free to, to reach out. I also wanted to give a quick plug um, for any of you who might be, um, might be looking for faculty positions or might know of people who are searching for faculty positions. Um, we are looking for somebody for uh, assistant professor or associate professor with tenure um, who studies broadly um, infrastructure equity. And this is actually part of a, a um, initiative that UCI has, which is called the Black Thriving Initiative. And they funded, had a competition for proposals for faculty cluster hires that could be spread across different departments on campus. Um, there are there is a cluster in environmental racism and health equity that they hired for last year. Um, there is a cluster in poetic justice, which is uh, I think partly filled right now. And then there is the cluster in infrastructure equity. Um, and so that program has positions. There's already people hired who are in urban planning and public policy, in law, and in civil and environmental engineering. And you're going to hear actually from a couple of them today. Um, but the fourth position in our system science is still open. In fact, it, this ad just went up and um, we're looking for somebody, the, the scientific focus can be quite broad, but we are looking for somebody who is first and foremost a physical scientist, environmental scientist, geoscientist, atmospheric scientist, or related fields. Um, and somebody who is working to with a vision to expand scientific knowledge that can address equitable, equitable mitigation and adaptation measures, address environmental injustice, and increase resilience within low-income communities and communities of color. So um, I have some printouts of that ad, so I'll put them in the back um, and feel free to grab them and also please share it. Okay, so um, the agenda overview for today, we're probably getting a little bit behind, but I think it's okay. We have quite a bit of wiggle room built into the schedule. <laughs> um, so we'll kind of try and keep the start times mostly on track. Um, but we have a series of panels. Um, you've all seen that already. So I'm gonna just skip over this really quickly. I just wanna say a couple of things about logistics. Um, for virtual attendees um, on Zoom, um, Actually, are the closed captions enabled? <laughs> Can one of the folks do that? Um, so the cl closed captions will be enabled um, and we are recording this. Um, we are asking participants to please write your questions um, that you might have for the speakers today in the chat um, and we will read them out. Um, and then also, uh, if you have any issues, you can just send a message to one of the co-hosts or email uh, Robert Garcia's email up here if there's 
a catastrophic failure of any kind. <laughs> And then um, for in-person attendees, the restrooms um, are right out the store. If you haven't seen them, the elevators across the lobby there, and they're just down the hall to the left of the lobby. There's also an, a gender neutral restroom down there. And there are um, there's a water filtration station and drinking fountains right there as well. Um, and all of the sessions today will be in this room, except for the indigenous engagement session which will be in 1310, which is just outside there, um, where you already have been, most of you, this morning. And then um, for the, the format for today, is basically going to be, for each theme, we're going to have the talks go consecutively, one after the other. And then we're going to have the speakers in that theme uh, join us at the front for a QA. and a um, And each Q&A will be moderated by um, somebody from UCI and they will have some prepared questions probably, but mostly we're encouraging questions from, from the fellows and from other people in the audience. Um, and so we will ask um, that the first questions come from, from a fellow, ideally. Okay, um, and then if you have any other questions, feel free to ask any of the people I've just pointed out or me, and it should be a great day. Any questions right now about like logistical things? All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Ninia, um, who's also got some opening remarks. All right, I am Nadia Campbell. I am the Executive Director of the Billy Anderson Fund. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and also thank you uh, for helping to make this event, event possible for both of you to come in and helped out this morning, um, and I've been on the planning committee. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about Bill Anderson, um, who, he, who he is, who he was. Um, Bill was raised in Ak Akron, Ohio. Um, he was the first Black disaster sociologist. Uh, he was part of the first cohort of the Disaster Research Center, which really launched the disaster research field at the Ohio State University, uh, but later, later moved to the University of Delaware. Um, Bill was um, really passionate about interdisciplinary work. Um, he, a lot of people didn't realize that Bill was a sociologist because he believed passionately that to, or in order to really address the challenges presented by hazards and disasters, we have to um, work across disciplines. We have to look at, at addressing the problems that people who are affected. Um, Bill also was very passionate about ensuring that the disaster research field was paying attention to the needs of marginalized communities. It wasn't a matter for him of an intellectual exercise of understanding how people might respond during a disaster. He really wanted to use research to improve the, the horrific outcomes that we often see when disasters and calamity strike in minority communities and other marginalized populations. Uh, he was a type of the field. He had a tremendous hand and role in shaping the disaster research field. Um, he uh, had started his career at Arizona State University as a professor there before moving on for about seven years before moving on to the National Science Foundation, where he really established a lot of research priorities. He encouraged international uh, collaboration and research. Um, he also then went on to work for a, a term at the World Bank and the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine. In all of his efforts, he really pushed researchers to diversify their teams, to ensure that they included people of color, that they included more women on their teams, that they, the teams of researchers going into communities affected by disasters, that they reflected those communities and their composition. Um, but that was also an area where he al always felt that he had never been able to make quite as much progress as he would have liked. Um, despite having such a tremendous influence on the kinds of things that people study, the kinds of questions people ask, the areas of collaboration that they engaged in, um, he was disappointed at the end of his career that he did not see more diversity in them. Um, he had a code with his wife, Norma, that uh, many of the fellows know this story, but I think it's really important to always tell. 
Um, often he would come back from these gatherings, these meetings internationally or across the country where some of the greatest thinkers of the time were most acknowledged in this field, um, were having these important conversations. He would come home and greet Norma in the mudroom of their house. And sometimes he would hold up three fingers. And that meant there were three people of color in that room and I was one of them. Sometimes he would come home and it was just this one finger. I was the only one. And so it's important in thinking about Bill and all the things that he accomplished in his career to, to think about how also we can help to pick up, pass that, but to have him pass that baton to us, to pick it up and to run with it and pass it on to the people coming up behind us. And that's what the, the, the mission of the Bill Anderson Fund is really meant to do. I want to read this quote from Bill because this is one of the things that we like to keep in mind in the BAF. He said, you rarely see more than a few persons from underrepresented groups at professional and technical meetings that discuss earthquakes and other types of hazards. Clearly much needs to be done to change this picture in all disciplines relevant to developing and applying knowledge on earthquakes and other hazards. Um, particularly being in California, I think uh, his, his focus in, in, in the earthquake Chrome regions uh, as part of his portfolio of research is really important, but specifically his words about the importance of bringing more folks into the fold as producers of knowledge and respecting the knowledge that exists in communities. So that's where the Bill Anderson Fund comes in. This organization was established by Norma Anderson, Bill's widow, after he passed away, unfortunately, in an accident in 2013. Uh, by the following spring, she had, she had established the Bill Anderson Fund and was recruiting students from across the country. Uh, she poured her grief into this organization, recognizing that he knew his work wasn't done and, and she was going to pick it up for him. I am part of the group of founding fellows, the first group of eight students that Norma recruited to establish this organization and get it started. Um, and it's an honor for me to now be in this executive director role. We helped to envision this programming and the next steps after it was after we achieved that first goal of setting up this organization. But the programming has a few key pillars uh, based on our own experiences as grad students of color entering this field. One of these is the professional development workshops. This is the event we're at right now. This is a core component of our programming. And these are important opportunities for us, which I'll go into a little bit later, um, to, to establish our networks, to, to meet other students, to make connections to each other. There's also mentoring, and that happens in a variety of capacities. Some of our fellows have assigned mentors to the BAF. Um, some of them are mentored by other BAF alumni. Um, and, uh, and there's also peer mentoring that happens within the organization. As some of us have advanced through, we've also sh shared lessons that we learned along the way with those coming in behind us. Again, that importance of passing the baton. The network of support is also really important. Knowing that there are other folks going through what you're going through as part of your graduate studies is incredibly important. We work with doctoral students within the Bill Anderson Fund and graduate school, all the research tells us, personal experience tells us can be incredibly isolating. Um, it's hard being one of the only ones or the only one in your department. Uh, there are a lot of unique challenges that underrepresented students experience in their, in their graduate studies. And so the Bill Anderson Fund's network, having these fellows meet together, forming partnerships and relationships and collaborations with one another, knowing that there's someone who could, they can talk to who's Familiar with their experiences is incredibly important as well. And then the newest component of our model that we've added is research partnerships. Uh, we have several uh, research partners currently, uh, studies that are underway either directly through the Bill Anderson Fund with me working with fellows. We also have fellows who have worked in collaboration with other university partners on studies, summer, through summer internships or ongoing engagements. Um, so creating more research opportunities for hands-on experience is incredibly important so that many of our fellows who don't always have opportunities to engage in these kinds of research opportunities in their own programs can access things outside of the network and not be constrained by what's available to them at their universities and in their, their programs. I'm also happy to say that we now have a, a growing alumni network. Um, we, as our numbers have grown, as beyond a trickle, beyond just a handful of us who have made it through our PhD programs, we now have enough alumni from this organization who have graduated on to get their PhDs. Um, and so our early students were master's students um, who have sustained the, the, 
the collaborations they had, the connections they had with each other by forming the alumni network, recognizing again that we're still important to each other. Um, so it's not something that terminates at the end of your degree program. It's something that continues. Our alumni continue to publish together, to engage in research collaborations together, um, and in some cases are now mentoring other fellows. We have fellows who have been recruited into the BAF and are currently actively being mentored by those who came through the BAF. Um, also, they're pushing the boundaries of academic research, finding new ways of addressing some of the challenges we've seen with the way that research has historically been done. So finding ways to counter the extractive model that, we're, that Kathleen discussed earlier, the problematic ways that researchers always uh, often engage in and interact with uh, communities, uh, challenging some of those and finding ways to utilize local knowledge, to, to respect our collaborators locally, to engage in research that's more reciprocal. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that's being done with the alumni network as well. Um, and I want to also mention that if you are interested in the Bill Anderson Fund, and this is something that is of interest to you if you're an underrepresented doctoral student enrolled in a program or considering your doctoral program for the future, applying, um, have a check, check out our website, have a look. Our application period is normally in the spring, late spring through late summer. Um, and so around May, check in on our website. We'll have our application window open then. Uh, the application, application process is relatively simple. There's an online survey that you fill out, give us your information, a couple of essay questions. Um, and each year we establish a small cohort, usually between uh, eight and, and 15 people, usually on the, around 10. Um, so a smaller cohort so that you know the people you're coming in with um, and that those, those folks coming into the BAF once again can connect with the community. We're not really focused on quantity. We're focused on bringing in folks who are really committed to this work and share in our vision as an organization. But on to the workshops. So we're at this event. This is our fall workshop. Um, again, these are important professional development training experiences. Today, we'll be hearing a lot of uh, presentations that are topical that help to highlight some of the issues being explored by researchers here at UCI uh, that, that intersect with the, the concerns of marginalized communities, how those uh, hazards and other issues that they're, they're studying are coming out in those communities. Um, again, these are also important opportunities for interpersonal connections to be built, not only between fellows, but also with the folks in this community. So the fellows will be talking with you, trying to network with you, expand their own professional network so they can find collaborators and colleagues who are like-minded and are interested in doing the kinds of research and with the kinds of approaches that they want to do. Network building. Again, this is a great opportunity for fellows to find professional mentors, to find future collaborators and colleagues. Um, and again, recruitment. So if you know someone who might be interested in the Bill Anderson Fund, um, you know, please uh, reach out to them, share our informational materials with them. I have a series of a set of flyers here that breaks down our programming and talks about it. I'm going to leave them in the middle of the room up here um, with more information on how to connect with us. Just want to wrap up with a few expressions of gratitude. I know Kathleen already went through these, but I just want to emphasize that the only reason these workshops are possible is with the support of our academic partners, our colleagues. Um, Kathleen, in particular, has moved mountains to make this workshop happen. She did not know me six months ago. <laughs> Many of the fellows know Vernon, Dr. Vernon Morris at Arizona State University, who's been a supporter of the Bill Anderson Fund for years now. He wrote a couple of emails, introduced me to Kathleen, to Mike Mendez, who you're going to meet tomorrow. Um, and she just jumped right in and just the heaven and earth to make this happen. She has put in a lot of time and brought in other folks like Robert into the fold. Carlo, I really appreciate you for stepping up as a fellow, knowing that you were local. I did not ask Carlo, he volunteered. He just stepped right up to this lady. Um, and I do also just, again, want to acknowledge our two graduate students from UCLA. Um, uh, they are, They've been really helpful too um, with uh, putting together our programming, putting together, helping with the logistics, uh, and also Dr. Aradna Tripathi, uh, who couldn't be here today. She's out of the she's out of the country. She really wanted to participate, uh, but she not only she was another person who uh, Vernon reached out to, who uh, just jumped right in. He set up a phone call. We had a chat on Zoom, and she not only offered to help support uh, this workshop financially, she sent out the word to get her grad students involved. Um, that is what real commitment to this looks like, is knowing that 
despite not having a, a personal relationship with someone, knowing that you have common values, knowing that you're working towards a common cause in this field. Um, some of the folks who are involved don't consider themselves disaster researchers, disaster people, and yet um, they jumped right in, recognizing, again, that we're, we're building towards some of the same goals. Um, so thank you to Arana and the Center for Diverse Leadership, as well as Jessica Hegman and Kira Fish. And once again, I won't go through the whole list of sponsors again, but, um, you know, they really make this possible. We are a small organization with a small footprint. Um, it's, it's me at the helm now that Norma is starting to step back. Uh, we have uh, just a few of us and a bunch of fellows jumping in at all times to volunteer and help out. Uh, so the, the sponsorship, the, the financial support from our sponsorship is incredibly important as a small organization that has historically operated on donations alone um, and is now continuing to expand. But uh, I just want to, again, thank our sponsors. We wouldn't be here without them. And so uh, if anyone, anyone wants to get in touch with me, my email address is up here, but I want to leave some time for us to get started. Thank you all. I look forward to having a great workshop. Thank you, Ninia. That was great. Um, so we're going to transition to our next thing on the agenda, which is our first panel. Um, so I see Nicola back there. She's perfect, right? Yep. Yeah. So Nicola, if you could come on down, I'm going to get your pocket pulled up here. Just bear, bear with us for a second. Yeah, so I just want to um, say that I'm going to briefly introduce our moderators today as they come up. So I already mentioned T. Trung is a postdoc researcher on the um, Climate Justice Initiative, and she's very kindly volunteered to moderate this first session. All right. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay. Um, can we have another round of applause for our other people? <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm T. Tron, I'm one of the postdoctoral scholars for the Climate Justice Initiative, and I'll be moderating um, this first session, Hydrologic Extremes and Resilience, which is about the um, basically water work that's done here at UCI. So we have two speakers here today. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Nicola Ulibay, who is, who is an Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at the University of California, Turbine. Um, she described herself as a multi-generational Nuevo Mexicana and grew up in rural uh, northern New Mexico, uh, where the abundance or scarcity of water is the dominant force for shaping the culture, economy, and environment. Um, the research focuses on environmental policy and governance, and has focused on redesigning organizational decision-making processes to result in better social and environmental outcomes. Um, she is a contributing author to the fifth U.S. Climate Assessment Adaptation Adapt 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 Chapter. And then an author of the book, Creativity and Research, Cultivate Clarity, Be Innovative, and Make Progress in Your Research, which is the product of the decade of experience training researchers about the benefits of creativity. And everyone at the UC is going to act on that for free. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, first, first speak, speaker of the day. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about some work looking at flood risk and flood management here in Los Angeles. And I want to spend the time, I'll be both talking about the, the content of the research, what we did and what we found, but also spending a little bit of time thinking about the process of doing this type of large multidisciplinary research, um, since I know it's probably something that many of you are either doing already or going to do at some point in your careers. And um, basically, we're part of a team. Uh, I say we because um, I'm on the team. Um, Dr. Alaric, who you're going to be hearing from in just a moment, was part of this team. Claudia, 
was going to be here at the back high. She was um PhD student on this project on their blog. This is a big, big group project. Um led in particular, oh, and motivation first. Um we think of Los Angeles, we think of California, and we really think about hazards like earthquakes, we think about hazards like wildfire. We think about nice sunny weather. Uh, you know, we've got 80 degree weather here today. Um, we don't tend to think about flooding as a hazard. Um, comments for anyone who's in the state show that we are woefully underprepared for flooding. Um, where we have a lot of flood control infrastructure across the state, um, and it did not do a good job of maintaining the but not abnormally large rainfall events that we got this winter. Um, and knowing that this was a concern, um, well before 2023, this team of researchers here at UCI got together to start thinking about, can we improve knowledge about flood risk and flood management here in Southern California? Um, the sort of cornerstone of this work is a very, very high resolution flood model called PRIMO, um, it's a parallel raster inundation model that was built by um, colleagues Brett Sanders and Joe Schubert here in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, I cannot tell you any details about the technical stuff in this model, for those of you who that if you do. Um, but basically, it's a super high resolution flood model, three meter resolution, that lets us look at, you know, parcel by parcel, building by building, what are the actual depths and expected flow rates of a, let's say, 100 year storm across Southern California. Right now, the model is built for Los Angeles and Orange County is what I'm going to be talking about today. We've started adding in places in the Inland Empire, um, but we're looking at really building this big regional model, but then very, very high resolution. And this process is we're using is what's called a collaborative modeling, where instead of we, the experts coming in and saying, we are going to build the model at, that we think that is going to, you know, illuminate everything we need to know about flood control. Um, we're instead trying to work with decision makers, with community groups, to understand what are the information needs that they have and construct models that will answer questions that they need. So we're, um, this was kind of a schematic around the, the general goals of a colla collaborative modeling approach. But essentially, you have the research team go in, work with community groups to see, okay, what, you know, what are the types of questions you have about flooding? What types of information do you need? What types of impacts do you care about? Um, what resolution would you like is helpful for you to make decisions at? Are you interested in hearing about a 100-year flood event? Or are you interested in hearing about a five-year flood event or a thousand-year flood event? What time, you know, what will turn period? And then, you know, slowly build out these visualization tools, these models. And then those can serve as the basis for collaborative, grounded decision making of a river. Okay, what are some different scenarios we might get? What if we, you know, put in a bunch of green infrastructure somewhere? What would that do to flood risk? Or how is this going to be, you know, redistribute flood, flood risk across different communities or different neighborhoods across the, the region? So this is the kind of general goal of collaborative model. And I got brought, brought into this team essentially to run this process. Um, and I will tell you, I had that is not my area of expertise. Um, so I study environmental policy processes, and I study, you know, the content of plans. I study, look at, look at these regulations. I look at how people are involved and how they make decisions. But I, I'm not trained to go out and do community-based research. Um, and so in doing this, it was kind of, you know, there was a little bit of, oh, well, you're the social scientist. You can figure it out which we'll all reflect on later. Um, but I still also wanted to try to find a research question within this that would be more within my area of expertise. And that's what I, the question that I'll be talking about today. So from this project, we sort of answered two distinct questions. Um, the first is the big picture question that's the, the high impact, okay, what do we know? What does this model tell us about flood risk in Los Angeles? So we're looking at questions around what areas of Los Angeles are at risk from a 100 year flood event and how are those risks distributed across different race, ethnic and socioeconomic um, advantage indicators. 
um, this paper was published in Nature's, uh, Nature's Sustainability, sorry. Um, and the short answer is we found that there is way bigger flood risk than any sort of any, you know, FEMA models or any other existing models estimate. And those floods are disproportionately impacting in particular non-Hispanic Black communities, as well as lower income communities across the region. Um, the piece that I want to talk about is this, as I said, this kind of piece that I wanted to carve out that's a little more in my area of expertise, which is looking at how the decision makers that we talk to understand the problem of flood. So what are the things that they care about? What types of flood events are they worried about? What types of impacts are they worried about? And how do they rate our region's ability to actually manage flood events? And this um, was published in Weather Climate Society earlier in the year. So when I say a problem frame, this is essentially an individual's conceptualization of a problem and its impact. So flooding is a very, very multi-dimensional thing. It has many different causes. You know, it can be caused by rainfall, or it can be caused by sea level rise, or it can be caused by a dam overtopping. Um, we have many, many different types of impacts. We care about. Do we care about impacts on buildings? Do we care about impacts on ecosystems? Do we care about impacts on the economy, et cetera, et cetera? And there's the dimension of those impacts that a person worries about shape what they're going to manage for. So this is basically the, the problem frame, the idea that a person holds about this problem is going to shape which aspects of a problem are addressed, where managers seek relevant knowledge, and which solutions are considered pertinent. So we wanted to understand, we talked to a bunch of different flood-related decision makers in the LA region, what types of flooding are they thinking about? And therefore, maybe what gaps might we be identifying? And um, to do this, we did focus groups with decision makers across the region. So these focus groups were part of that collaborative modeling process. Um, half of what we talked about was presenting some draft models, visualizations, getting feedback on, hey, does this make sense? What other data, you know, what other visualizations would you like to see? What other um, layers of data would you like to overlay, et cetera, et cetera. But then we also asked questions relating to the types of floods that people are worried about, the types of impacts they're worried about, and views on their, our ability to manage floods. Um, we did four focus groups. The first was with planning and policy organizations in the region. So your land use planners, your transportation agencies, um, building authorities, things like that. Um, we had a, a one that was looking, working with community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations that are working more directly with um, predominantly lower income communities around the area. Um, one with state and federal agencies, so the California Department of Water Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers. And then one with the local flood control districts, so Los Angeles um, Department of Flood Control and Orange County Department of Flood Control. Um, and to analyze these data, um, we use what's called a modified grounded theory approach, um, which basically is an inductive approach where we took all of the stuff that they told us and we sort of grouped it into themes based on what they talked about, what they told us was important. So rather than coming in and saying, we think, you know, we hypothesize ahead of time that these are the things that they want. Um, so we grouped it into themes, and then we used a, a principal components analysis, so a statistical approach to then group the topics to see what things people talked about together. Um, I'll explain that a little bit when I get to that result. Um, I'm not going to dive a ton into the individual topics that people talked about. Um, essentially, they raised lots and lots of different concerns relating to flood risk. Um, so we heard about lots of different types of floods. We had people concerned with, you know, coastal flooding caused by storm surges and sea level rise. 
We had, of course, the people really concerned about rain-driven flooding. What happens if you have a heavy rainstorm and there's no stormwater infrastructure in an area? Um, we heard about lots of different types of exposures and vulnerability. Um, in particular, people were really concerned about infrastructure and impact on housing. Um, in terms of um, concerns related to management, um, the two biggest concerns related to our ability, um, just a total lack of detailed data on flood events. Um, so a lot of people talked to me and said, yes, we have FEMA maps. So those are the big, big swaps that say you're in the flood zone, you're not in the flood zone. Um, but wanted more details on like actual, what types of, what flood depths can be expected and at what flood returns. Um, and they're also quite concerned about the region's ability to evacuate. Just that we have, you know, massive, massive region, very, very high density, and not great transportation options um, for anyone who is driven at any time near rush hour on you know, any of our freeways, it's not good. Um, so one thing I want to highlight though with this figure is the fact that most of these concerns were raised by many different types of organizations. So each of the colors here is a different type of organization. You've got nonprofit, for instance, or local governments, we've got special districts. And what we see is that pretty much all of ours, we've got lots of different colors. So it does it means that each of these concerns is kind of cross cut It's not like just nonprofit organizations are raising concerns about a particular type of flood or a particular type of impact. Then we have people from lots of different types of organizations. And this is promising because it suggests that maybe we're not going to have sort of coordination problems in trying to solve flooding. Um, because they're all have somewhat shared concern. However, we do see that these concerns group into three specific problem frames. And in particular, in general, an individual would basically only talk about the stuff associated with one of these three problem frames. Um, so this on the right, Left here is our principal components analysis. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is within a, a general space, which topics tended to be talked about in tandem and which things are not. The green shade boxes are the flood concerns that are positively associated with each of the three components. And blue shaded boxes are the things that if you are talked about that component, they are very unlikely to talk about, so negatively associated. Um, to talk through this, our first flood concern, we're calling climate change and large floods. So these people talked about flooding. They were worried about big river floods. These are when you have tons of water suddenly shooting down the Los Angeles River or the Santana River, and worried that that was going to be made worse from climate change. And they're really worried about the big flood, the thousand year event flood, 500 year event flood. Um, in terms of exposure and vulnerability, they were particularly worried about impact on infrastructure as well as impacts on housing and impacts on the environment, on the economy, sorry. And when we talked about management concerns, they were worried about our ability to evacuate and um, a lack of flood insurance across the region. The second group of people were in what we call the environmental justice problem frame. And these people worried about rain-driven nuisance flooding. So these are going to be storm events that basically, in some cases, they talk about almost every time it rains. There are some neighborhoods where there's not good stormwater infrastructure, the roads fill up, people can't get, you know, you can't walk across the road, you can't drive through the road. There's maybe impacts on housing, um, but these are, you're not your thousand year event. These are things that happen every single storm. And in terms of management, they complain that there is no data whatsoever on these types of storms. That all of the models tend to look at, you know, your hundred year storm or longer. They wanted to know what happens with your five year event. Also, they were really concerned about the sort of intersecting concerns with pollution being mobilized. So there wasn't good information on where various toxic sites were, where there was a lack of water infrastructure, and they wanted all data on all of these. 
they were also concerned about a lack of blood insurance. Um, and then there's a lot of cut off here, but one of the big concerns that they raised was historic underinvestment in the neighborhood where this news was flooding. Where these are communities often that were uh, formerly redlined communities where there was, you know, a lack of infrastructure built way back in the 1950s when they were developed that is now causing all of these problems now. Um, and then a lot of our groups is what we call the ecosystem. Um, so these folks were worried about both coastal flooding and river driven flooding. And they were in particular concerned about impacts on the ecosystems. So here we see that, um, and they were worried about a lack of general lack of awareness of flooding in terms of management implications. So here with this, we've got kind of these three different groups all talking about different types of flooding, different groups of people being impacted by flooding, um, but not there wasn't a lot of sort of cross-cutting dialogue across the three three groups. These are all problem points. To conclude, I want to spend a little bit of time just reflecting on doing this type of multidisciplinary, large team-based work. Um, and one thing is that it takes a lot of time to do it well, and in particular, to really try to understand each individual's expertise, experiences, and sh develop shared definition. So, don't think, oh, just because, you know, oh, I'm a social scientist, therefore I know how to work with people and do all of these different sets of analyses that, oh, that's what a social scientist does. Scientist does. Or, oh, you are a chemist, therefore you must be able to do all the, you know, this particular type of lab analysis. Or, just, you know, anything. Within all of these disciplines, there are very, very you know, discrete level of expertise. And so take the time to understand what are the particular skills that the people you're working with bring to the table. Um, also, think of different expectations. So different disciplines. Um, in my field, our currency, our primary currency is publications. Um, that is very, very different than if you're working with, say, an engineer, where they're most worried actually about getting grants. And there's less emphasis on the publications that come out of those grants. And in some fields, they're worried not even thinking about publications at all, but conference proceedings are the sort of the currency of the realm. And so making sure that you all understand those things matters. Um, so you don't, you know, so you have clear expectations. Um, and then lastly is thinking about definitions. That two, you might be using the exact same word in very, very different ways. So if we say mitigation, what does that mean to you? To mitigate something. Are we talking about lessening it? Are we talking about um, getting rid of it entirely? Or, you know, what is resilient to me? Any of these terms. Um, second, and this is kind of related, is just don't be afraid to own your own expertise. Um, this is something that I did not do a very good job of in this project. Um, so I came in I was fairly early on the tenure track and I wanted, you know, wanted funding. I wanted, I was excited about working with collaborators, but I kind of pulled in and was like, well, this isn't, this isn't really what I do, but I guess I can figure it out. You know, I, you know, I took classes on how to do focus groups and I, in grad school, I can kind of do this. Um, and I think now going forward, I'm much more confident to say, no, actually, I don't want to work on this particular thing unless there's a more direct sort of policy or governance dimension of something that ties directly to what I do. Um, and similarly, be willing to hear what other people tell you about what they would like to work on. Um, one big piece that I see happening a lot is sort of these token roles, where you'll have a project that gets all put together and then all of a sudden they realize, oh, for this, you know, this funder or this whatever, we need so we need a somebody we need a social scientist, or oh, we need a statistician, or oh, you know, whatever that thing is that you realize we didn't have that expertise. Um, bringing on somebody super late, you can end up with, you know, avoiding not having 
respecting that expertise. And the person might then feel less involved in the overall project, and probably you're not going to have a good project. Um, so for all of this, one of the key things is just to bring the team together as early as possible. Um, so if you can sort of co-create the project with everyone, then you're much more likely to come up with a project that is both a unified whole and also that everyone has buy in. And the last piece, um, actually, I'm gonna skip that. You do need clear leadership. Don't just assume that the project will run itself. Um, but this is something that when I was starting my PhD, I didn't really recognize the extent. Um, but doing interdisciplinary work comes with a task. And it is slower to do. So it takes more time. You have to either you're working with multiple people or you're having to train yourself in multiple disciplines, multiple methods. Um, it's also way harder to get funded. It's way harder to publish. You, you know, there's so many times when I'm trying to publish something and they're like, oh, well, that actually looks like a, you know, a planning thing. Try the planning journal. And they're like, oh, well, actually, that looks like a geography thing. Try the geography journal. Oh, well, that actually, you know, if you're like, just try to publish it and communicate it. It's really, really hard. And I know many of you in the room because you want to solve real problems. And oftentimes solving those problems means doing something that is interdisciplinary. Um, but just know that it's going to mean that your career trajectory doesn't look like somebody who just did the traditional disciplinary route, and that's going to make things harder. Um, so just, you know, it's not, I'm not dissuading you from it by any means, um, but it is, it is a challenge that we have to face. All right. Thank you. Um, is Laura here? Oh, hi, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'll get their talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, um, Dr. Nicholas. So that talk, I really like what you um, talked about at the end about interdisciplinary teams and attacks. Uh, uh, I know that you and Dr. Laura were together. Um, and so we'll have some, I think, really great questions at the end about. Okay, so our next speaker is um, Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura Lair, who is an associate professor of water economics and policy here at UCI. Dr. Lair has expertise in environmental economics and spatial statistics. Uh, her research focuses on the development of improved strategies for ensuring safe water for all, assessing water um, equity in water and wastewater services, and decision support for water resource management. Her professional experience spans the public and the private sectors, including international organizations like the World Bank, the Global Development Network, and the Fulbright Scholar Program. Um, it also includes think tanks like Resources for the Future, International Water Management Institute, and Environmental Consulting. She holds a PhD from the University of, Northern, of North Carolina and was also a postdoctoral scholar at Columbia University's Earth Institute. Uh, right now, she currently runs the Water Equity Lab at UCR. Well, thank you so much uh, for that introduction and great to be here uh, today uh, with you all. Uh, so yes, coming uh, to you from UCI, uh, I have an interdisciplinary background. We actually started off in the geosciences. Uh, I was a hydrogeologist uh, working at an NGO in West Africa for some time. I also worked in the private sector in environmental consulting. I eventually looped back uh, to research uh, when I was working as uh, an economic uh, analyst, uh, analyst um, at an environmental think tank in DC at the very beginning of the Obama administration, there's a lot of activity surrounding climate action. Uh, so that was very exciting. And then eventually made the decision to head back to grad school and get started uh, down this academic. Um, and so uh, 
what I've been up to this uh, fall, I've launched a collaborative project with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, NCAR uh, is the acronym. And I'd like to quickly mention opportunities that are available to a variety of early career uh, researchers. And um, NCAR uh, in general is an NF-supported research center focused on climate science and other Earth uh, system sciences, as well as they like to pull in social science as well. So um, I, I really want to highlight, because I didn't appreciate this until uh, about a year or two ago, um, that NCAR is interested in expertise that extends beyond just atmospheric uh, science. Um, if you're uh, somebody in the last year uh, of your PhD program, they do have um, a, a, a really great program for uh, early career folks just starting out uh, as faculty members. Uh, this uh, provides support for two years to collaborate uh, with a team of NCAR scientists, also supports a graduate student. It's a really uh, a terrific uh, program. Uh, if you're still uh, well in the midst uh, of graduate school, they also have an advanced study program, and these experiences can range from a one-month visit uh, to their uh, facilities in Boulder, Colorado, uh, or it could be an entire summer uh, spent there. And they really like to work with students either in the pre-dissertation phase, thinking about their research topic, or who are in the midst of their dissertation and wanting to bring in uh, expertise. So I just wanted to highlight these programs because I think they're, they're overlooked, especially uh, by, by social uh, scientists. So I so wanted to highlight uh, that. All right. So the new project uh, that my research group uh, is focusing on is really addressing climate-driven failure of wastewater systems uh, and the social impacts of those failures. Wastewater can be a little bit overlooked uh, when compared uh, to drinking water in the U.S., yet it has big implications for public health. Uh, about one out of every four households across the country is not connected to centralized sewer services. This means that they have to rely on their own systems that can fail at exceedingly high rates uh, uh, due to a lack of upkeep, unfavorable soil conditions, as well as heavy precipitation. Uh, and some places, uh, particularly in central Alabama, the situation is so concerning that there is evidence that hookworm is resurging in the region. Again, big implications uh, for public health. Um, and there, there are examples of, of wealthy communities also being uh, impacted, for example, uh, mostly in terms of coastal water quality and recreation. For example, Long Island, uh, New York, as well as the Miami uh, deed area. So this really is a nationwide uh, problem. Um, and more frequent and severe precipitation events uh, pose risk to communities. The risks of um, wastewater systems that households are attempting to manage on their own, uh, particularly septic systems, are really not understood. We really don't understand um, what future climate conditions hold for this type of decentralized uh, infrastructure. And this situation is particularly concerning in the Southeast. Uh, where there is this confluence of um, a, a, a lack of sewer, uh, sewer infrastructure coverage, as well as uh, flood risk that's largely going to be exacerbated in the future by increased severity and frequency of precipitation events. And then there's also concentrated uh, poverty. And so all of these factors combined don't lend themselves um, to a great situation that is uh, coming uh, in the future. And it's currently unknown how many communities are at risk under present conditions, let alone what the future holds once we layer on top of this increased severity and frequency of uh, recent events. Um, and the social impacts are also unaccounted for um, and would be absolutely essential to account for if we want to direct investment to those communities who are truly uh, the most uh, in need. All right. And so 
What this project uh, is doing uh, is combining uh, community-based interviews and simulation modeling to understand climate risks to wastewater infrastructure. Um, we'll be conducting a failure assessment of wastewater infrastructure, both under current and future climate conditions, uh, in order to understand how historical rates of failure are linked to environmental conditions, as well as housing and population characteristics. And the social impacts of this failure will uh, be accounted for and revealed through household interviews in Alabama. Um, how households can be impacted by this? Well, uh, in the central Alabama area, there's a dense clay that makes conventional septic almost impossible. Uh, even moderate rainfall can cause wastewater backup into people's homes. And so when this happens, uh, people's quality of life is truly impacted. They either have to dramatically reduce or forego water use in their home. And these sorts of um, uh, uh, impacts of time and impacts of uh, living conditions not currently accounted for. So what this study seeks to reveal is, well, what are the impacts when you can't use water in your home where you dramatically have to curb it back? Uh, what are the costs of cleaning up this unsanitary uh, condition? Um, what are the costs to you and your household if you then have concerns about your drinking water quality? Um, because you have right standing untreated wastewater at the surface, perhaps you're taking some sort of um, averting actions uh, to cope with this, uh, as well as the cost of repair to your system. So trying to account for these many overlooked costs currently so that they can be incorporated into investment and targeting decisions because uh, Right now, we have a once in a generation investment in water and wastewater infrastructure in this country, yet we're not currently accounting for these types of impacts to uh, direct that. Um, last but not least, um, uh, besides you know, diving into household experiences, uh, a simulation uh, model will, will represent decentralized wastewater failure and resulting social impacts and really allow us to explore how more severe and frequent uh, precipitation might exacerbate this problem uh, in the future. Uh, so that's sort of a, an overview of uh, ongoing active work uh, that'll be continued over the next two years. I'd also like to share uh, an example of water equity research that has been wrapped up so you can sort of get a sense for, okay, what about research um, that's, that's already been uh, completed. So this leads us to, right, although this is focused on wastewater, I'm, I'm originally much more of a, a drinking water uh, person uh, and um, got interested in wastewater since, well, one, it's overlooked, and two, if you ignore it, it's only going to come back to you on the drinking water side of things. Um, so this leads us uh, to a study that focuses on uh, drinking water. It's also grounded right here uh, in California. And this study asked, how are California drinking water systems doing, right? California is the first state to legislate the human right to water. And so there's, you know, big goals uh, that the state has, but how are we actually realizing uh, those, those lofty goals? Um, surprisingly, few uh, studies address uh, water equity and, and water disparities for, for drinking water systems. Uh, and I think one of the reasons uh, this is, is because there is a, uh, a massive data gap when it comes to water equity. We don't know uh, what the community makeup is of communities being served uh, by water utilities. Um, demographic and housing information isn't incorporated into the main tool that the EPA uses to assess environmental justice, the EJ screening tool. This is done for many other uh, environmental media, but it's not done for drinking water regulation, which seems very surprising, right, in the aftermath uh, of Jackson, Mississippi, of Flint, and then again, you have this once-in-a-generation investment that's coming through and is going to be allocated yet we currently are not capturing uh, disparities uh, in drinking water quality in order to direct uh, that investment. Um, so what uh, I did in order to sort of overcome this 
data cap uh, at the national level um, was uh, take water system boundary information that exists for some states and it does exist uh, for California and sort of overlay this on top uh, with uh, U.S. Census uh, boundary information to be able to say, okay, what does each and every uh, community served by public drinking water systems in this state look like? This is done for over 16,000 water systems uh, across uh, the state. Um, all right. And yeah, this process mostly um, uh, relied on an assumption of aerial weeding, uh, and this was um, uh, weighted by the portion uh, of, of a service area uh, that was covered by uh, census uh, units, uh, census geographies. All right, so, so overall process here. Um, and so by creating water system level demographics, uh, this study produces a more credible estimate of the association between water quality violations and demographics uh, of communities. And so the goal was really uh, to see, well, what communities are really bearing the brunt of this, and also to see if we sort of split uh, small uh, and large water utilities apart, the assumption being that large utilities have a technical, managerial, financial capacity to provide safe water, and perhaps uh, small ones don't, what disparities do we see across these two? Because disparities would especially be concerning on larger systems, which we would assume, right, have the necessary resources uh, to perform well, provide safe water, and would typically not be prioritized for uh, federal and state dollars. Um, so let's let's take a look here. So what this study found was some good news, some bad news. The good news is that after California's human right to water uh, passed in 2015, there has been a notable uh, decline in the number of water quality violations uh, across the state. Um, so uh, human right to water and our state regulatory agency uh, receiving the power to uh, consolidate utilities that aren't doing that well uh, and uh, being able to um, better fund small struggling water utilities. The good news is that we see a dramatic decline in terms of utilities not meeting EPA standards for drinking water quality. Um, so that's that's some, some good news. Um, violations do vary geographically, um, and this is sort of um, uh, our, our usual suspects of which you know, areas of the state are really struggling. Well, it tends to be the Central Valley, it tends to be uh, the Imperial Valley. These are the regions of California really struggling uh, with water quality uh, concerns. Now, the, the bad news when it comes to who has safe water and who does not have safe water across the state, while some gaps in regulatory compliance have narrowed, some have not. Um, and so what we do here to sort of look at where are these compliance gaps and across which dimensions do they exist, um, what this graph is showing is the, the solid line on top uh, is showing you for severely disadvantaged communities across California, what portion of them are in violation in any given year. And this is state defined based on income uh, of community. And then everybody else who's not state designated as severely disadvantaged, well, the portion of utilities in violation then is being shown in the dash line on the bottom. Uh, so we see this fluctuating right over time uh, across the past 20 years. And where we end up, uh, the most recent year uh, that this uh, study included was year 2018, is there's um, well over a 10 percentage point compliance gap between those communities uh, designated as essentially low income, severely disadvantaged by the state and, and everybody else. So there's still work to be done uh, in terms of realizing human right to water uh, in, in California. This gap is mostly due to arsenic uh, concerns, but also nitrate um, uh, and nitrate compliance has actually worsened since the passage of human right to water. Uh, so that's a bit concerning. Um, so, so this is, you know, disparities uh, by income. 
We can also right, uh, narrow in on communities by race, communities by ethnicity. And again, here we sort of see these persistent compliance gaps um, that ideally, if we were realizing human rights water, we wouldn't see, right? Ideally, this gap would be reduced uh, to zero. So this still, this again, this is highlighting still work uh, to be done. Um, the importance of uh, disparities is also highlighted through regression analysis. So not only past graphs are mostly showing summary statistics. Um, so what these results indicate are, you know, how are small utilities doing? These are regression results just for small utilities. And these are regression results just for large utilities. And what these stratified models would indicate is ideally, right, because we know small systems are going to face challenges because by fact of being small, they have a smaller population, uh, a smaller ratepayer base to provide them resources to have a well-functioning water utility, right? So we would probably expect, right, a lot of concerns um, with small systems being able to comply. But we would hope that the larger systems would be adequately resourced. And the EPA makes an assumption that they are because they're not prioritized as much for um, state uh, revolving fund assistance, uh, uh, for example. So, okay, let's take a look at this. Well, if we narrow in on the, the small systems, it seems like we're seeing disparities pop up across um, virtually every dimension, right? Uh, across income, across race, across ethnicity. When we bump up to the large systems, um, a really uh, surprising uh, finding is that a lot of uh, the, the disparities go away by a function of bumping up to a larger size. But one that still persists in the state and likely should be prioritized by state regulators is that those utilities serving African uh, American communities, even when we go to the large systems, are still facing uh, more compliance concerns related uh, uh, in comparison to everybody else. Uh, size does not overcome uh, those disparities uh, across this. So to briefly summarize, um, the study does find evidence of equity concerns even in the aftermath of human rights and water uh, in California. And uh, this highlights the need uh, for environmental rulemaking to consider these disparities and not making the assumption that larger utilities in particular have to be less prioritized uh, for assistance. Um, and, uh, and, and so I hope this provides right, sort of a, an overview of future work and past work and water and wastewater uh, research that's ongoing at, at UCI. So with that, I'll close down. We can question and answer. Um, oh, right. I can make my right? So sorry about our technical difficulty still this morning. <laughs> I think some of these things will be the Okay. Okay. Um, so um, so much for your awesome presentations. Um, we can start by taking questions from people in the room. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hold up the microphone when you have a question. I'll get some steps in. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joshua. I'm a BAF fellow. This is uh, so I think for both panelists, I'm interested in the parts where you did either community outreach, whether via surveys, interviews, or things like that, or even started to partner with community organizations. What were some of the methods that you used to reach out? Were there um, relationships that you already had established that you leaned on? And so when you're doing work like that, what are some recommended routes uh, to make sure that you're covering the population that you want to look into? So, yeah, while I, while I didn't touch on it in 
my presentation, uh, my research group recently wrapped up um, household surveys in Orange County addressing trust in drinking water quality right here. And I would say um, it took well over uh, a year uh, to develop a collaborative uh, research relationship uh, with a local uh, environmental justice organization, Orange County Environmental Justice is very tied in. Perhaps uh, some of our PhD students are um, currently conducting work with them. Uh, and so I would say it, it's really um, uh, valuable uh, as academics to establish strong ties with community groups that are already on the ground and have built up trust directly with households. Um, that was incredibly useful uh, for our work versus if we were just to go in on our own as academics, we would not have had this longstanding uh, relationships with the community. So I would say communities and organizations can be really powerful partners in doing this work. Yeah, and um, I would say for our project, it was a lot developing a lot of new relationships. Um, to be honest, um, some of this was sort of trying to work through our networks. So even if we didn't individually have a connection at an organization, we tried to see, oh, hey, you know, talking to other other people who might have have worked with these organizations and trying to make connections there, such that we could start to build that trust. Um, for the uh, flood control districts, um, we actually, a number of people in those districts had received their, had done uh, in either undergrad or graduate training here at UCI in engineering. And so that was an easy, like, hey, UCI is doing this. Do you want to, you know, we'd love to work with you. Um, one thing that I will say that has been really challenging is then maintaining those relationships over time, though. And this, um, for this project, we have been actively applying for funding to continue this work and to actually now take these models and figure out, okay, how, you know, what do we need to do to improve flood management in the region? Um, and the partnerships that we've built now, they're, you know, very willing to support us in trying to apply for funding and, you know, putting this in, but then there's at a certain point, you know, we haven't been successful at landing that next grant yet. And it's really hard because we don't want to continue drawing on their resources and their time. But at the same time, you know, we don't want to be doing the extractive, oh, well, we came in, we got the stuff that we need, we got our publications, by. And so it's, um, it's this weird balance when working from an academic setting where like, realistically, we can't do this work unless we can pay the salaries of the people to do the work. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of grants, they're two year, three year grants that lets you get one piece of the work done, but you can't develop this longer term um, project. So actually, sorry, I had a second question, which tied to uh, kind of what you were talking about. Um, and it was just like my question was on reporting back to the community. So how is that looking for y'all's project? Because I know we talk about grants, right? And it's a whole phase because you do need money. Um, but something as simple as just sending a pamphlet out, you know, and translating our research to the community uh, is something that's very important for this, you know, next step as to addressing these issues. So on our project, um, part of what we looked at when we did those focus groups, trying to get a sense of like, how would you like this tool piece, you know, this information to be shared. Um, and what we ended up doing was we did wrote a GIS story map. So for, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is basically a tool where you can kind of write a blog post, if you will, that then has a bunch of different maps and stuff embedded. So we were able to summarize some of the key findings, you know, what we've done and what we found. But then it also links directly to the actual models that we built. So they can then go in and look at this and say, okay, I want to see this particular flood return, or I'm, I'm interested in, you know, they can you know, zoom in particular neighborhoods they're looking at, or look at different ways of visualizing the depth of the flooding or the velocity of the flooding or anything like that. So we, we tried to actually make the tools, you know, share them in a way that they're 
useful at least. So even if we're not doing, you know, convening the next steps of this collaborative process, um, we did share that through the four formats. And uh, yeah, and on the drinking water uh, quality side um, for household uh, surveys that were done throughout Orange County, what came out of those household surveys were um, that folks were really curious about the uh, the the nature of their water quality, uh, and and they were interested in receiving information um, that was more frequent than just like once a year water quality reports that a lot of people happen to miss. Um, so what we uh, have, have planned to do is provide folks with uh, the, a summarized version of the sampling information that's coming out of uh, their utility and making it digestible for folks. And also perhaps highlighting concerns um, that wouldn't be flagged by the utility themselves. Because for example, um, if we're talking about arsenic, which is a huge issue across California, California, there is um, this gap between the level that's regulated and the level that would be perfectly safe uh, for human use. Uh, and we're trying to highlight uh, for folks, you know, in what range uh, of that gap uh, are, is there tap water quality? Because if it's pretty close, then hopefully, right, they can be aware of this um, so that they can take uh, proper protective uh, action. So I think it, it was sort of um, really informative uh, to hear uh, from folks themselves about, you know, how they would like to be informed, what types of information they would like to receive about their drinking water. Um, and this ultimately uh, loops into, uh, Policy brief. So, if we're talking about okay, what information do we provide households? It seems like you know this sort of um, feedback about summarized information about their drinking water quality. What information do we provide water utilities uh, and water districts um, in California? Well, working with uh, community-based organizations such as um, Orange County Environmental Justice, they're in you know they're. Um, uh, actions are very geared towards moving the needle, right? Uh, and, and having direct influence over water districts. So uh, being able to co-create uh, a policy brief and fold in all the you know rich academic information that we've learned about, you know, what could really uh, build community trust and what people want to know to fold that into then their sort of more action oriented uh, work. I have a question on the First presentation, you spoke about the method that you guys use called the, the modified grounding theory, and then you use the principle of component analysis after. So you're you're using a qualitative approach, but that principle, the component analysis, gave you quant numbers. So I wanted to ask about like your framing into like why did you choose to go that route versus just using coders or Atlas TI? And like, did you lose anything, gain anything from that decision? Yes, so this, uh, we did a, a very traditional sort of modified grounded theory. Approach. So we went in, we used in vivo, you mentioned Atlas TI, we used in vivo for this, uh, which is a qualitative coding software where you, you know, you go in, you can identify the text that is relevant to a particular theme and label it at, you know, at that code. Um, and we, you know, so we went through and we just identified all of all of the text that was relevant to each of the themes. We and we're sort of iteratively refining what those what those particular blood concerns were and how we would label them. Um, then it came to trying to figure out a way to group them into these problem frames, since that that was our original goal. And we could have done some sort of just like a pattern matching type approach where we tried to identify, okay, which of these things were done in tandem. Um, but I had had the idea of actually taking, you know, each of the individual's responses and which, you know, which things they had talked about um, and using a more statistical approach to that in order to identify, you know, to, in order to like, identify with a little bit more rigor that there are in fact differences between these different components. Um, so that was essentially the motivation. Um, I will say it was, this was the first time I had taken that kind of approach. Usually I treat it's either, you know, a fully qualitative or a fully quantitative analysis. Um, 
but overall the the reviewers were fairly positive about the approach um and yeah and i think that it gives us a little bit more confidence in the claims that we can say these are three different problem claims relative to if we had just said you know the these, these things tended to be talked about in tandem. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, explain a little bit on the community outreach and engagement you spoke of. Did either of you find any barriers or hesitations with from community members or organizations? And how did you kind of get past that? Um, and then especially when you're looking into continuing these relationships with those communities. I, I mean, definitely. The, I think the biggest barrier is just a a lack of time. Um, so in general, everybody that we reached out to was interested in the project, and we were we were deliberate in who we contacted. We tried to find organizations that were you know that were working on something relating to flood control already. Um, but the I think there there was a lot more interest than ability to actually take the time to participate and give us feedback. Um, and so there were some, a few people who like sent us a little email feedback and things like that. But I think realistically, especially when you're working with community groups, they're very, you know, they're small groups. They might not have the technical expertise. They might not, you know, they definitely usually don't have very many resources. And so for it's a choice to figure out, okay, is this where we want to spend our time versus all the many, many other sort of fires that we have to put out. Uh, so that was, I think, the biggest challenge was just getting, creating the space and time. Um, I would love if, you know, for future work, the ability to actually compensate people for their time. We didn't have that built into our initial funding. Um, but I think that, that that can help a lot with trying to overcome some of these barriers. I would say, yeah, beyond that, in terms of the practicalities of um, bringing groups, especially smaller community-based organizations, onto your grants, is that they might not, again, have the in-house technical expertise to um, uh, apply themselves and to kind of uh, develop their component on their own. Uh, and so it can take a lot more time because sometimes it's you, uh, the PI, filling in the gap and then trying to work with your university uh, budget office um, to uh, get them to fill in some of the gaps too. And, and right now, um, university budget offices can be a little bit resistant in terms of why are we partnering with this organization, right, if they can't even uh, fill out some of these basic forms. But I, I think that's absolutely essential uh, to address if we do want to go over to this um, embedded work in communities. Uh, good morning. I have two questions for the first presentation. Uh, the first one is for the data that was collected that you share with us, was there any looking at like the chronological change of floods in relationship to climate change across time, right? So looking at how was it in 2000 versus today? And the second part of that is, was there also any data collected from the governmental agencies that were a part of your study and how this change or increase impacted them? So we, for the, the, what I've presented today, we did not look at um, any sort of chronological trend. So all of the flood models that we developed were using just historical data. So to the extent that there was a trend in there, it was embedded in terms of the sort of variability of, of flood risk. Uh, I don't remember exactly what time period was, was included as the base model. Um, we are in all of the grants that I've mentioned that we've applied for, or um, we're hoping to be able to add some climate forcings into those models and be able to better predict, you know, what what trends will look like in the future in terms of, you know, increased rainfall or um, storm surges, anything like that. Um, but it wasn't included. Um, as for the government agency specific impacts, I mean, we, you know, they were included in our focus groups. Um, so very much heard a lot of the sort of the concerns that they have. Um, there was, especially for the flood control districts, I think a little less willingness to admit that the, the models that they are using are, or, you know, the infrastructure that they manage is perhaps 
inadequate, um, which makes a lot of sense because then that would mean owning up that if, if there is a if there is a problem, it's on them. Um, however, after this project, they actually the Los Angeles um, County Flood Control District started a, a larger um, equity focus uh, emphasis. So really trying to figure out why why there is such disparate um, uh, disparate flood risk across the region and what they can do better there. So, you know, some some influence at least, um, but. Hi. Um, I actually have two questions. So I'm like a health educator at heart and you all kind of spoke on it already, but I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more in detail to the health promotion and health education side of your work. Um, I heard you all mention that you did things like story maps and et cetera, but I'm a little curious as to whether that may be, uh, may have too much academic jargon and if it was really broken down and translated into a way that community members can really understand. I mean, we we try to use as much of a you know as little jargon as possible. Um, and just to give you some uh, examples on that, in our flood maps, um, typically you'll talk about flood depths in terms of meters, and we actually communicate our flood risk in terms of the depth relative to a person's body. So, is it ankle deep flooding versus knee deep flooding versus you know? Of a person, of person's height. And so we had some of those, and also like for flood velocities, is it something that would be able to push a person? Would it be able to push a car? Um, so trying to communicate those the flood risk in a little bit more understandable language. Yeah. And for us, we were, um, I guess, when we were going through household uh, interviews and giving folks uh, a taste uh, for how their water utility was performing, we were trying to go a little bit beyond what they would receive from their water utility themselves. Um, so we were trying to highlight any issues of, uh, you know, missed sampling, these sorts of things. And again, uh, using very uh, minimal uh, technical jargon, jargon and trying to highlight uh, contaminants that folks might have already heard about before, right? Folks might have heard about, like, let's, for, for example, arsenic, but they might have no idea what a disinfection byproduct is. So really highlighting contaminants that folks might already uh, be familiar with. And trying not, I guess a lesson learned there was um, when we were doing some of our pre-testing and sort of describing, uh, you know, possible health consequences of uh, working contaminants, trying not to use alarmist uh, language um, and trying to highlight, right, um, for example, uh, cancer risks and trying to highlight how, how minimal uh, of, a, of an increase there might be when exposed to a given amount of contaminant, rather than just saying you might get cancer as a result of this contaminant. There was some um, strong reaction in the pre-testing of that trying to be uh, as, as moderated as possible. Thank you. Um, and my second question is, um, whether there was any capacity building of the, the community organization itself. Um, I know that we receive our currency for our careers and everything, but um, like you mentioned, doing policy briefs and things like that, were there some other things um, more so related to like the sustainability of the organization to kind of carry this work further and not have to depend on academics to come in? Sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, a policy brief is a document uh, you can point to, uh, and perhaps, yeah, Connie can speak uh, more about this on uh, the next panel, um, but we're also in the midst uh, of, of trying to figure out uh, outreach to water utilities and how we can collaborate together uh, on that, since eventually that's going to be what moves the needle uh, for folks on the ground. So I would say I don't have any answers right now, but we, we are in the midst of that process of, you know, how do we combine our forces, work together with you know, providing scientific evidence, with providing knowledge of communities, uh, and, and to the water districts themselves, you know, telling them what we've uh, learned so far. Thank you, Dr. Libari, and thank you, uh, Dr. Aller, for your presentations. My name is Cristina Munoz de la Torre, um, a PhD candidate at the University of Iowa. And uh, my research or my question is directed to Dr. Libari about um, your findings basically show that the larger utilities or the larger district 
lot of um they have a bigger base tax base right or a base in general to fund the work that they do but they're the ones that have the larger disparities in terms of serving african-american communities um and it kind of is you were contextualizing your research within the IRA and all these policies that are coming out to support more funding and um, to underserved communities. But my question is, is giving more money to these larger utilities really the answer? Like, is that what you're proposing as a solution? And, and where, and in your research, what do you think was some of the root causes for that? Um, disparities given that they have more funding than the smaller so yeah so great question i would say um the takeaway from that would be we probably shouldn't um only prioritize small utilities for state and federal resources. Not that we should all of a sudden, you know, just send everything uh, to the large utilities, but that, you know, large utilities shouldn't necessarily be counted out when we do that prioritization. Uh, there's a whole, each state gets to set uh, its uh, priorities for how uh, it's state revolving funds that go to support uh, water utilities. And so, you know, maybe there needs to be a rethink there. I think another thing that needs to be uh, rethought is considering the local community's income level and therefore the resource base that the utility has to draw upon. Because right now, uh, especially when the EPA does its assessments on is a community going to be burdened or not by regulatory requirements, um, the only thing that's done is uh, seeing uh, what the difference in burden is between small systems and large systems. And then the national median income is assumed for, you know, what is it going to cost utilities, big and small? And then what is the nationwide median household income? We're not considering uh, the, the very um, uh, diverse range of uh, median household income that are community specific across the country. I think that's something that needs to change. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tamara Doss, and I am the Deputy Director of the Tuscaloosa County, Alabama Emergency Management Agency. So when I heard Alabama, ding, 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 <laughs> my ears went up, especially the Black Belt community. I am about an hour away from Lowndes County, um, and they are the heart of the Black Belt. And so Lowndes County is at a forefront of a landmark um, federal environmental justice case that could establish sanitation as a civil right. So my question is, geared towards you, of course, um, what role does the involvement of federal entities play um, in addressing the issues of wastewater infrastructure in marginalized rural communities like this? I think it's absolutely needed to move the needle because I this situation isn't anything new. This has been playing out across generations uh, in terms of wastewater inequity, especially in the Black Belt of Alabama. And it's only been in recent years that essentially the state has been shamed. Uh, by, well, it, it didn't even start with the DOJ's case against Lowndes County. It really started with uh, a UN report. UN reporters, right, which are typically going into lower income countries and shutting light on what's happening there um, for whatever reason they happen to be in the black belt of Alabama and were shocked they were horrified by what they saw because a lot of times and, and you're very familiar with this a lot of times what happens because people can't have functioning conventional septic is that they're straight piping there's no treatment whatsoever as folks are attempting right to remove wastewater from their homes and it's going directly um onto the surface and working its way into water bodies. And then we have researching in, in the US. Um, so I, I think that that essentially shaming of state agencies, either by uh, international organizations that happen first, but then also the federal government, I think that's that's necessary uh, to move the needle because it seems like left onto its own, the situation wasn't gonna change very much. But I think it's really, um, uh, uh, promising to now see, well, well, not only public attention, but there's resources that are starting to come towards the state. And so that's encouraging. Thank you. My name is Tay Weevil. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first uh, is uh, on the our participation in interdisciplinary research. 
but it, it also goes to you because you mentioned the National Center for Atmospheric Research that offers opportunity for other disciplines to come take in it. So I, I, I want to find out how do you really prepare? You've, you've talked about the challenges, all right, but uh, based on your experiences, how do we prepare to partake in these uh, transdisciplinary researches? Because sometimes you, you, you partake in this research, you are a full member, maybe graduate research fellow on this project, and you sit there and you, you are lost in the process. Um, based on your experiences, how do we prepare as uh, fellows uh, on these projects in order to uh, uh, benefit from the teams that works and also to contribute uh, our quota towards such researches. And then my second is on the selection of uh, groups for the focus group discussions. Uh, what uh, informed the decision um, to select these four groups for uh, your research? Thank you. Um, so on training for doing interdisciplinary work, um, there are um, there are a number of online resources. Um, there are, I'm not going to remember things, everything off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, but there is a, one is here at UCI. There's a large center for um, I don't remember translation. Uh, you know, the James Science Gold Accelerator stuff? Lab, huh? The Team Science the Team Science Accelerator Lab. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, yes, and so this they're they're interested in doing team science, and so they produced a they do re workshops here at UCI, but they've also produced a number of like online guides on how to do team science. And we'll walk some of these, like walk you through what, you know, how do you figure out what the team is that you need to do to build and how do you go about, you know, sort of facilitating these conversations to help you figure out what everyone's expertise is and so on and so forth. Um, there are also trainings, um, if you email me offline, I can try to collect some of these and put them together. Um, but there are there are specific trainings on how to understand, how to learn, how to navigate some of these interdisciplinary spaces. Um, and it, I think definitely having thought through what some of the conversations might look like can be very, very helpful before you actually step into doing it yourself. Um, to the extent that you have the opportunity as a graduate student to, you know, if your if your advisors are doing any of this work, maybe talk to them about how they go about doing, you know, building these conversations, doing the work. Um, so you, uh, you know, see if you can even sit in on some of the meetings, anything like that. To also, I think learning firsthand helps a lot as well. Um, on briefly on the focus groups, um, we. We're um, basically we were trying to cover a diverse set of flood related stakeholders and decision makers. Um, and so trying in trying to get feedback for our models. And so we were thinking about, uh, you know, looking at people who are would be using flood related information in their decision making or advocate advocacy. Um, so we ended up with kind of local government authorities who whose work might be affected by flooding or whose work affects flooding. So looking at land use planners, looking at transportation agencies, looking at um, local environmental um, environmental authorities, things like so all local government. Um, we definitely wanted to get a perspective from a non-governmental perspective for people who are actually living and working in communities that are facing floods. Um, so that was where we pulled in um, several nonprofit organizations who have done a lot of work on combating nuisance flooding and combating, uh, trying to build new infrastructure in particular in their communities. Um, and then wanted to get also sort of the regulators perspective. So that was where we brought in the state and federal agencies as well as the, um, the flood control districts. 
So it was kind of just trying to, it was a, a sort of deliberative sample, sampling approach where we're trying to get voice, uh, a diverse mix of voices, but all people who are sort of playing more of a decision maker role as opposed to just doing focus groups with residents, for instance. Sure, yeah, it's, I think for interdisciplinary uh, work and team science uh, beyond uh, sort of reviewing the literature uh, that's out there on there, um, you know, there's probably short term experiences that you could get in uh, grad school, for example, you know, perhaps on your own campuses. Um, uh, here at UC Irvine, um, there's multidisciplinary programs that bring folks together uh, during the academic year to work on uh, a targeted problem. There's also, I mean, NCAR is an NSF funded uh, entity and they're huge on, it's now called convergence uh, science. And this is why they're seeking to bring folks in either for one month experiences uh, to NCAR or for the entire summer. And there they're uh, trying to build up a, a cohort of folks, right? A cry, I mean, ranging from the physical sciences uh, to the social sciences. And I, I think um, that program in particular is really well uh, run because, you know, they're providing a little bit of, you know, uh, the theory and background knowledge behind team science while folks are actually engaging uh, in team science. Perhaps, yeah, uh, Carlo could speak more to this with a uh, firsthand experience uh, through the NCAR programming. Yeah. I have one more. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Um, my name is Amiru Bakoma BA Fellow. I'm more um, curious about your experiences, your lived experiences, like Dr. Lea, you worked in um, West Africa. I wanted to ask how your lived experiences, you know, inform your current research and what can we learn from that? I, yeah, I would say in particular, um, West Africa was a turning point for me. Uh, I headed there as a hydrogeologist studying groundwater surface uh, interactions uh, for reservoir systems and how to better manage this for small agriculture. Um, but it was a real turning point for me because I essentially, um, became more committed to social science as a result because what I saw, right, was that um, a lack of adequate access to uh, safe water wasn't a lack of technical know-how, right? It wasn't a lack of physical science knowledge. It was everything happening on the social side. Uh, it was the policy, it was the economics. And so I sort of did a 180 uh, as a researcher and um, became committed uh, to the social sciences because that's at least what I thought was going to be the needle for folks on the ground. So yeah, absolutely. I think by you know having this this range of experiences, um, you can kind of see you know where you can fit in better than if you're just sort of in an academic bubble. Uh, thank you, thank you both for your presentation. I'm Nelson from uh, East Carolina University. Uh, my question is for the first presenter. So. Were there situations where your respondents mentioned or talked about the aftermath of these flood events? For instance, in uh, eastern part of North Carolina, after flooding, people complained about runoff from hog farms. How it how the flooding exacerbates these <laughs> runoff events? So I just want, I'm curious to know if there are situations like this where. Uh, there, are, there are some local businesses that this flooding event exacerbates uh, the run of that, the uh, uh, waste that comes out from their businesses and eventually affects the residents of these communities. Yes, this is definitely something that came up. Um, and um, in particular, this was in the kind of environmental justice frame, but that for a lot of the, the communities that they talk about where there was bad stormwater infrastructure, um, one of the big concerns that came up was that if there was also sort of toxic waste facilities, so places where there was, you know, a lot of different heavy metals or paint um, or, different, you know, different industrial activities essentially that had been left out. Um, and so there were communities where they were very, people would be very worried about um, the you know run polluted runoff after a rain event and in some cases they actually they talked about places where people had gone in and tried to build some of their own stormwater infrastructure just to move it away from 
their homes and get it, you know, keep it away from where, you know, they might have to touch this, this very polluted in water. Um, so it definitely did come up. Um, yeah, but one thing I will note is that, so we have the, the nuisance funding came up, but when we did these interviews, this was in 2021, I want to say, 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, so this was before the big floods this last winter. Um, and so as far as like a big flood, most people hadn't actually lived through a flood. If they did, it was when they were little kids. Um, the most, it was, it was more perspective concerns as opposed to, um, except for those, the news public was very much My question, uh, I'm Jean-Claude Ndongo, a PhD candidate at Florida Atlantic University and BAF fellow. So my question goes back to uh, Christina's question earlier about uh, funding and policy to address social uh, equality. And this is uh, for both our, our, our speakers. When you spoke with the community, were there any proposed solutions or recommendations to address the economic impact of flood and also of uh, water quality? Uh, any any locally, um, uh, I guess, conceived uh, solutions. So in our um, in our focus groups, the main solutions that came up was they weren't necessarily targeting just economic impacts, but it was thinking about ways to move away from the traditional gray infrastructure and start to incorporate more sort of green infrastructure and nature based solutions, such that we could have you know, a flood control project that is, you know, the, the 90% of the year when it's not being used, a nice place for people to go and provide recreation access and things like that. Um, so what, those weren't necessarily tied directly to the economic impacts. Um, people definitely raised economic impacts and business closures and inability to get to work as an impact, as a concern that they had about flooding, but then there weren't proposed solutions that, that on the, yeah drinking water side of things there, there were a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, creative ideas that came out of these household interviews from community members directly uh, for example you know some community members said you know wouldn't it be great if water utilities interface directly with the public perhaps you know setting up uh you know annual uh community events to share well what's the current state of water quality you know how generally do we treat the water um and so having these you know be sort of you know neighborhood uh type of events where you know folks can just uh come in uh for an evening uh after work that's something i probably would have uh come up with on my own um and also i guess uh really voicing uh, you know, some folks, some communities were happy with the current state of communicating uh, with their water utility, but others weren't, um, you know, others were saying uh, that, you know, they have their water shut off without um, having uh, notification ahead of time. And so there seemed to be uh, communication gaps even right here in uh, Orange County. On um, the wastewater side of things, uh, I didn't get to mention it, but there is um, sort of a community uh, or rather neighborhood scale wastewater systems that are being conceived. So wouldn't it be great if not every individual household had to manage this unmanageable situation that can also be incredibly costly to uh, install a system that would be functional in the dense clay of the Alabama Black Belt. We're looking at like 10K to 20K for a system that's at, just out of reach for folks. Um, and so wouldn't it be great to have a neighborhood scale system uh, that's above ground that could be supported by several uh, households? Uh, and ideally it could be run by an outside management entity, right? So the households themselves, like who wants to manage their own prey wastewater? You probably want to service and leave it to right technical uh, professionals and don't have to worry about that anymore. So a demonstration system is actually currently being installed in a small town uh, of New York, Alabama. Importantly, it's, uh, it's being installed by collaborators of the University of Alabama, who are engineers that are going to test the technical performance of the system. And importantly, it's not being tested out on the community first, 
It'll be tested out um, on a uh, uh, university uh, facility that's shared between the University of Alabama and Auburn. It's their architecture uh, studio. So it'll be tested out on students first, um, but the community is buying into this because they don't have to be the test dummies, right? And so they can see this demonstration system eventually town buildings, the city hall can be connected and at the very last phase, actual households can be connected. So it's, it's attempting, right, to build up the trust that, you know, this new system isn't going in and folks are going to be tested upon. Uh, it's, it's going to be tested first before folks opt into it. All right. Uh, thank you so much for our hydrologic experience. About community engagement, uh, we actually had um, Kayla Viegas from OCEJ in the Zoom. I saw maybe she's not there anymore. But yeah, like community-based partners are so important. And I hope you bring your questions to um, the next panel and call, which happens after our break. So, um, Kathleen, the break is until... Let's add five minutes, so 10.50. Okay, 10.50. We'll so, um, bio break, return here at 10.50. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>